Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. We actually started this verse last week, but we'll back up and take another running start at it this morning. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work in your own work with your own hands as we command you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. And last week we looked at these three phrases that were in that and, and talked about them. And, and uh, we talked about the idea of increasing more and more, that we're always and ever growing in our faith and in our level of service and in the things we do. Uh, we talked about aspiring to lead a quiet life. And we talked about the idea of to mind your own business. And uh, mostly when we hear that in our world today, mind your own business, it's somebody telling you to stick your nose out of what's going on in my life. And that's part of this, obviously, but there's more to it than that because there are some things that are our business that we need to mind in, in our, our relationships and things of that nature. So we talked about that uh, a little bit last week. And then the next one is to work with your own hands. Why do you think Paul brings this up? I mean, that's kind of a natural given, isn't it? You just expect that. Why do you think he, he brings this up in the context of when he's writing to the church of Thessalonica? First off, idle minds have uh, issues. Okay. So if you're working with your hands, and most of us do, that's something during the week that we have to do to make money in order mm -hmm. to live and to help other people live. Okay. All right. So we work to provide for ourselves. We work so we have something to help other people with. Yeah. I don't know if it's just because we were in ministry for a while, but people used to think that we had extra because we were Christians. We should just give it to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of possessing your things that you work for and not ex expecting other people to just hand it out to you, Worship. Well, if you're working with your hands, you don't have time to do what Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you're busy working, you can have, tend to mind your own business. You aspire to lead a quiet life because you're, you're tired at the end of the day because you've been working uh, with your own hands. I, uh, I don't know this, but I'm, I'm guessing that since Paul included these particular things, maybe this was an issue that he had heard about within the church of Thessalonica, and maybe universally to every church, no matter where it was. 
that there was a, an issue with this of, of not leading a quiet life, of not minding your own business, of not working with your hands. And, and as a result of that, there was a, maybe tension within the church as, as would come with those, those particular things. And again, even when we think about helping other people, which we should do, we know that's a part of Christianity, but even when Paul was writing about widows, was it just a given that because the widow was a widow, she got something? No, there were certain requirements and qualifications and, and situations in life that had to be met before she was, as we would say, put on the roles of the church to be helped in that process. And so we, we're to work with our own hands. We're to take care of ourselves and, and do our best to provide, obviously, for our family. And by doing that, we can provide them for the work of the church uh, in addition to that because we have more than, than hopefully what we need to, to, to live on. And so... Again, aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, to work with your own hands. And the reason is that you may walk properly toward those who are outside. So, quiet life, minding your own business, working with your hands, all of that translates into, shall we say, your influence on those outside the church. But okay, these people within the church are, are doing this. They lead quiet lives, they mind their own business, they work with their own hands, and that, in Paul's mind, elevates their, what's the right word, credibility uh, within the community and at large because they're doing these things that, that uh, uh, Paul had encouraged them to do, and so it was a, a way of walking properly toward those who are outside and not being, shall we say, hypocritical in the way you say you should be and the way you actually are. Uh, in your life so that you may walk uh, properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. And uh, when it says lack nothing, what does that mean, lack nothing? I am lacking a boat. I don't have a boat. So I'm lacking something. Is that what he's talking about here? No. What is he talking about? Jim? I think he's talking about contentment. Contentment. Okay, contentment. All right, so that you have what you need, which God promised he would provide for us. Have what you need, but content with that. If you're not working with your own hands, then you're going to be lacking some things because you're not going to have the ability to provide for yourself. And so he's saying that you lack nothing. And the things that I think Paul has in mind certainly is not Kevin having a boat. There's nothing wrong with having a boat if you have one. I just don't have one. And... Uh, I probably could if I wanted one, but that's that's another story altogether. But it's it's not talking about just that we lack, we have everything we could ever dream of or imagine or want. Uh, you know, there are people in the world, I guess, who have the kind of money they can do that. But I don't think he's talking about that. When he's talking about not lacking anything, it's things of, of life that make us content and comfortable. Oh, I was just going to say, it's talking about just having the essentials you need for a comfortable everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, essentials we need for an everyday, everyday comfortable life. And, and uh, I think all of us in this room fall in that category, don't we? I don't know any of us here who, uh, not saying you may not struggle financially once in a while or, or have more bills at the end of the check than you had money in it, but, what, but for the most part, we all, we dress, we dress nice, we have homes we live in, we drive cars that to get here, and we are comfortable. Uh, in our lives. Maybe not as comfortable as we want to be, but we're comfortable and that's because of, of the mindset of, of doing that work that, we, uh, that we're talking about this morning. So increase more and more that you aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your own hands, walk, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside that you may lack nothing. And that, that phrase there, walking properly toward those who are outside, why is that significant? What, what's, what's important for me? Because does the world really care how I walk? Flo? Well, we do all these good things. In the, in the first chapter, Paul talks to Thessalonians that they were good workers mm -hmm. and doing good deeds. And, and so he's reminding them that, but I think if we do all these good things, the outside world, those who are not Christians, are going to see and respect our lives. Okay. And at that point, we really don't need anybody else to depend on if we're doing the right thing. Okay, so it's a matter of, the, of their respect, whether they agree with our beliefs and our practices or not. Those people are living what they preach. They're living the faith that they claim to have, and they're not hypocritical about that. And so it's a, it's a significant way to, to influence people. Bubba and John. 
we're all ambassadors of Christ. Amen. People see Christ through us mm -hmm. the way we live, if we live according to the scripture. Amen. I've got a little slogan in front of my Bible. I look at it and I say, a good example is the best servant. Mm -hmm. And when we think about, you may walk proper toward those who are on the outside. Think about the qualifi qualification for an elder. One of those qualifications is they must have a good report from those outside mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so it, it's, it's significant that we have that relationship with people in order that they might be drawn to what it is we have and, and drawn to the gospel. John, you had a comment. That's exactly my thought. Okay, all right. And so uh, walking properly toward those who are outside, it's, it's a matter of our influence. It's a matter of our character. It's a matter of, of representing who we say we are and who we claim to be. And that's really, really important in our, our lives. If our lives outside of the church building don't reflect what they do inside the church building, then there's something wrong. Yes? Anymore, our lives are a huge shock to a lot of people. Yeah. And we have to be careful not to shock them to us. I mean, not, not that we should hide who we are, but sometimes just by being around you, they feel condemned, mm -hmm. and they feel like horrible people. So we have to be really sensitive to not come across as better than Absolutely. We've got to, the way we interact with people who are on the outside needs to be with love, compassion, and, and caring. And, uh, well, and to say something about treat others as you want to be treated. And, and that idea there is, is what we, we, we hang on to. And uh, it's, it's important that our, our lives reflect what it is we say we are in order. For, Number one, just to not be a hypocrite. And number two, so that maybe that will draw people to us in some way and to, uh, ultimately to Christ in some way. And uh, chances are there was somebody in many of your lives, say that maybe you weren't raised in the church, that drew you to Christianity, that caused you to see what the life was what the lifestyle was, and as a result of that, you became a part of the church because of that individual who was portraying that Christ-like manner and attitude in their lives, which was appealing to you or to somebody that, that maybe you know. All right? Other thoughts, comments? Flo? I became a Christian because of the example. Mm -hmm. He was Marshall. I had uh, two roommates in college. I think we were playing football together, and two of them, my best friend, Ed, Glenn, who were members of the church, mm -hmm. didn't know that kind of stuff. We were living together. And uh, we go away games, uh, Canyon, Texas, Utah, and come back Sunday morning, four in the morning, beat up, tired, and wore out. And then Ed and Glenn, every morning they would get up and go to church. Mm -hmm. These are two college boys. So they raised it right away. And they were an example to me of how important our Christian lives are. And the example we use, that led me to believe. You know, these guys, I, I said, why are you going to church? They're all beat up, all tired, and bruised, yeah. and they went to church every Sunday morning. Yeah. That was an example I'll never forget. Sure, absolutely. So Flo shares with us the example of two roommates he had in college who, no matter what, went to services on Sunday morning and made an example to him and, and, and encouraged him in that right direction. So that's, you know, probably all of us have stories like that. Les? Do you think that the ones here that are Okay, what do you think? Who, who does the outside include? Everybody, doesn't it? I mean, there's no, no distinction there. We're just people we like outside the church, but we do this even for the people that we don't necessarily uh, care for as much. I guess that's a bad thing to say in a, in a way, but maybe that we're not, well, maybe fall into that category of enemies that Jesus talked about. Love your enemies uh, in, the, in that regard. And so we, we owe it to them to, again, present ourselves as Christ-like, even the people who may hate us. John? Even the person that takes your parking place at Costco. Even the person that takes your parking place at Costco. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think the most important thing that I see is walking with God. Mm -hmm. You know that because we have the Spirit of Christ, God is with us mm -hmm. all the time, wherever we go. Mm -hmm. So when we leave here, we can leave God here. We're taking a witness. So in our lives, like you say, 
different things happen. Somebody will cut you off on the freeway, and you may say something explicit, and all of a sudden you go, oh, God, forgive me, because I didn't mean to say that. You know, it was just, my life was at stake or whatever. So we find ourselves all day long being confronted by different things that Satan throws at us, mm -hmm. and we have to remember you are representing God mm -hmm. on this earth. So yeah. therefore, imitate Christ just as Paul did. Yeah. Yeah. What did Jesus say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify God in heaven. And that's uh, so important for us to keep in mind, especially when we're not here. It's easy to do that here in the church building because we're all on the same page. It's hard when I'm out there by myself and get cut off in traffic or whatever the case may be. That, that sometimes makes a big difference. Uh, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. This is some of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, sometimes I get asked, what's your favorite passage? And I freely admit it changes uh, day to day what's going on in life. But I've always enjoyed this particular Scripture because it's a Scripture that ends there, comfort one another with these words. These are meant to be words of comfort uh, as we deal with our, everything we do in our lives. And he starts off by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. What does it mean to be ignorant? That word has a different connotation in our world today, perhaps, than what Paul intended. What does it mean? Not to have the information. Not to have the information. It's not a, a slam, per se. That's how we use it. Oh, you're so ignorant. But that's, that's the, the meaning of that is simply uninformed, unknowledgeable. You don't have all the information. So Paul's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, which implies what was going on in the church at Thessalonica. Died, okay. The ones that have already died were they and whatever. Right, yeah. So I think Sandy's exactly right. It implies that the fact that Paul's talking to them about this is they were having issues with this and maybe didn't fully understand what it all meant. And when a member of the church died for whatever reason, uh, and and you know what happens after that? What do we what do we do with that information? And we all of us still think about that, don't we? What's it gonna be like when I die? What's it like when my parents died, when Kelly's parents died? What, what was that like? And we, we know, I think, up here, we have a set of knowledge about what happens after we die, but we don't really know everything about that. And so the church there must have been uh, concerned about that. How much so, I don't know, but it was enough that Paul wrote them about this to say, I need you to be understanding of what's going on in, in, in this particular context, that you're you can be comforted because life is going to be life and you're going to lose people you love and care about because that's just the nature of the beast. It's appointed for man to die once and after that judgment, the scripture says. And so when we think about that and, and the idea of being ignorant, he, he gives us the information we need to know. I'd kind of like for him to give it us more, wouldn't you? you know, just a bullet points of everything that's going to happen when I die. So I know, but he didn't do that. Because he obviously thought he didn't need to do that. We didn't need to know everything. What we didn't need to know is that uh, what he's talking about, about here. And again, concerning those who've fallen asleep, we know that means those who have died. Marcia? Well, if we knew everything, we wouldn't need to say. Right. So there's a reason why we don't know. Right. right. Yeah, faith is, and, and hope is, is, is wrapped up in that as well. Because when you know something, you don't hope for it. When you have something, you don't hope for it. And so we, we don't have all that information. We have to trust that God will take care of us as he said he would whenever that time comes for, for any of us, uh, young or old or, or, or whatever the case may be. We have to have that trust that, uh, that it's going to be okay. Uh, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who will fall asleep. Here's why, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Sorrow. What, 
what must it be like to have somebody that you dearly love die and know they are outside of Christ? You've all had that in your families, haven't you? You've all experienced that in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And it's, to me, that just adds to the grief and to the sorrow. Uh, but concerning the, those who've fallen asleep, talking about, I'm presuming, those who are in the church, those who are part of the Lord's body, you don't sorrow for them as though you have no hope because you know where they're going. You have that hope. You have that confidence in what's happened to them after they've left this world behind. For we, if we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? We make that confession before we're baptized, don't we? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, and and we, we express that belief because we know it's important. We believe that Jesus died and he rose again. If he didn't die, what's the problem? No, none of us would, would rise again. There would be no sacrifice for sin. There would be no atonement for sin. There would be no propitiation and all those things that Flo was talking about in his Wednesday night class uh, in, in, uh, in those great words of the Bible. We wouldn't have any of that if Jesus hadn't died. He would have been just another teacher, maybe a good teacher, maybe the greatest teacher, but that's all he would have been as a teacher. Because, again, we understand that it requires the shedding of blood to take away sin. And we believe that he rose again. If he died but never rose, what would that imply for us? No hope, yeah. He was just another human being, maybe a good teacher. And yes, he died. Anybody can die. Anybody can be killed. But if he didn't rise again, then he's just like every other religious, so-called religious leader in the world. But he rose again because of the power of God. He laid down his life and then he took it up again by the power that he had. And as a result of that, we have that hope and confidence of something beyond this mortal life. And that's, I think, a large reason of why we do what it is we do. Again, back to our, our, our uh, theme verse. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? And that's what Paul's writing here about. Again, that's uh, chapter 2 and verse 19. We have that hope and that confidence that there's more to this life than just what we're living right now. And the promises that would have been made about that coming life indicate that it's going to be spectacular. Spectacular. I mean, just the phrase, there will be no more sorrow or tears, is enough for me. Isn't it for you? Just that one little phrase means that it's going to be a whole lot different place than this world. No sorrow, no pain, no tears. I like the sound of that, don't you? And that's what I want, and I hope that's what you want, and that's what we want for each other because it's, again, it's going to be spectacular. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. We will see them again. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that helpful in what we call the grieving process of saying goodbye and so long for now because we know that we'll be together again. And that at that point, they'll be, we'll be together again without the fear of ever having to part anymore. And I, again, I just think that is a spectacular a spectacular thing that we've been promised all made possible uh, because of Jesus Christ. So he's going to bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And there's going to be that great reunion. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, not Paul's opinion, not what he thinks, but what he's saying to you, this is the word of the Lord. That we who are alive and remain, now why does Paul put that in the present tense for himself? We who are alive and remain. Weren't some of them thinking that Jesus was coming pretty soon? Mm -hmm. which, I, I, it was an important church though that they said apparently that, that was a problem. Everybody was thinking Jesus was coming so they stopped working and mm -hmm. you know back to the working with their own hands. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that could very well be the case. They all thought Jesus was coming again, so why do I need to be doing any of this stuff? He's coming quickly. He's coming soon. And so why do I? I don't need to go to work every morning. I'm just going to pray and do what I want to and have a good time and enjoy the last little bit of life here. And so there was that, uh, that thought of an imminent return of Christ. And so when Paul says, we who are alive and remain, he's not, I don't think he's making any doctrinal statement about this, the timing of the second coming because obviously Jesus didn't come then, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, uh, kind of a side uh, note about uh, about uh, this particular topic. But they were thinking, they were thinking as though Jesus would come in their lifetime. Anything wrong about thinking that? No. And every generation since has thought the same thing. Exactly, thought the same thing. This is going to be the generation. And, and those who believe in the signs of the time, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, I'm sure, has got somebody triggered about the second coming of the Lord, wars, rumors of wars, and all of that. And so every generation has kind of felt that way. And there's nothing wrong with that because we ought to live as though Jesus were coming in our lifetime so that we're ready. Uh, and so that if, if, uh, if he does come, then we're found blameless and spotless and ready to go if that should be the case. Now, will that be the case? Only one entity in this universe knows when that's going to be, and who is that? God. And one of these days, it's going to happen. My lifetime, who knows? My grandkids' lifetime, don't know. It could be another 2,000 years. It could be another 5,000 years. It could be this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We just don't know uh, when that's going to, to happen. And so Paul was saying, we who are alive and remain... We're living our lives, the things he's just talked about, leading the quiet life, and working with our hands and not getting in other people's business. Those things we need to keep doing because it may be that he comes in my lifetime. And I see that. And if that happens, then you need to know that those who've gone on before you are coming back with him. <clears throat> and as we get to the end of this passage, you know you're going to go be with them. And there's going to be that, that reunion uh, together. Uh, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. If I'm alive when the Lord comes, I'm not going to get precedent over those who are dead. It's all going to happen uh, as, as once, uh, and I'm not going to precede those who are asleep, those who have died, those who have gone on. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That's what we were told way back in the first part of the book of Acts, wasn't it? When he ascended into heaven, what did they say? The same way you saw him go, he's going to come back. And we know that. Uh, that's the promise given to us. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout. Why a shout? Okay, to wake those who are dead. Do I have your attention now? With a shout. Uh, and uh, uh, the voice of an archangel. I wonder what a voice of an archangel sounds like. And what it will sound like on that day. Imagine that's going to be <clears throat> for the saved, the faithful. It will sound like a joyous voice. And for the people who are not, what do you think it will sound like? The voice of doom, the voice of woe, and, and, and all of that because of the, of the situation. With the trumpet of God. And again, <clears throat> I'll put all this up because... We're not going to get deeply into it. There are a lot of people who believe that there's going to be what we they call the great snatch, also known as what? The rapture. The rapture. And uh, again, a lot of people believe that. The Left Behind series of books, uh, was Tim LaHaye wrote those? Is that who that wrote those, if I remember correctly? And all of a sudden, just poof, all the Christians were gone and the world was left on. And uh, unfortunately, you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. And so... We don't believe that. And the point I was headed toward is when Jesus comes again, everybody's going to know. There's not going to be any doubting of what's happened. It's not going to be of, oh, I heard a rumor of that. No, you will know when that happens because of these things Paul is, is saying here. It's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be hidden. It's not going to be partially revealed over the course of time. The whole world will know it when that event takes place. And we, we have to be ready for that. The dead in Christ will rise first. So actually, the dead in Christ 
will get precedence over those who remain and are alive. I don't care if I'm the last person in heaven, just so long as I get there. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be the two million per. As long as I get in, I don't care what order, because time's not going to mean anything anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if we'll wait in line or how that'll all work when we get there. But uh, you know, if I'm at the end of the line, that's just fine. If I'm as if I was in front of the line, if that's the way it works, flow. Like Paul's teaching in the Romans, you got to read the Romans. Right. What what a comfort to know that. If I'm faithful and obedient, and I die tomorrow, Jesus will bring me back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that, that's that's comforting, isn't it, to know that and to know that we'll see our loved ones again who are in, in Christ and, and uh, spend eternity with them. There are aren't there times when you would dearly love to talk to somebody who's gone on before you, talk to your mom or your dad again, talk to my grand grandpa or my granny, uh, my granddad, my grandmother, just a. Uh, you know, share with them things that's going on in my life, and I can't do that. But one of these days, we can. And I'm going to throw this out there, and you tell me what you think about it. You know, we, we always talk about when we get to heaven, we're going to talk about all the things that have happened in our lives to the people who are there, and we're going to ask God all these questions about why He did this or why He didn't do that or what happened with this. Kevin's own very personal opinion is we're not going to care. It's going to be so spectacular there. Everything that happened here is done and gone. And we're not going to be thinking about that. And again, that's my opinion. I couldn't prove it with scripture if I had to. But I think that's something significant to think about that, that we're not going to dwell on what happened here because it's going to be so spectacular there. Bubba? Uh, well, I always think when we moved here in this sorrow, mm -hmm. so I've always believed we're not going to have any memory of any bad things in our yeah. life. When yeah. we get to uh, my, my mom in particular, I think I've told this before, was very bothered by what it was going to be like to be in heaven and know that some of your loved ones aren't there. And that I was seriously bothered her to the day of her, her death. She uh, And she she adopted the mindset of, well, we just really won't know each other in heaven the way we did here. It'll be different somehow. And maybe that's the case. I don't know. But it seems to be implied here that he, him bringing the dead in Christ back with him, didn't that imply some knowledge of, of them, per se? I don't know. I, I, uh, that's just kind of my thought process on this, that we will know one another, one another in heaven, but somehow everything that's sorrowful is not there for us. How's that going to work? I have no clue. Again, it's one of those things I wish you had Penciled in inside of the margin of the Bible. This is way how it's going to be. Less. The only thing that we know for sure about heaven is that we will be praising God. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing Scripture reveals to us. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll be praising God. That's what we'll be doing up there, and uh, and obviously enjoying it for eternity in, in that in that process because of where we get to live. So uh, again, it's. I think this is a, a deep part of scripture that, that we ought to read often because it's so important to understand what it's saying to us about not only the future for what's going to happen, but how we ought to be living our lives right now. Yeah. It's kind of like riding a roller coaster. Yeah. If you've ever been to Ohio and rode the beast, you know what I'm talking about. There's one line for the front seat, and there's a line for everybody else. We waited to get in the line for the front seat when we went with the team group. And I'll tell you what, the minute you get on that thing, you're not thinking about anything. When you get to the top and you're looking down and there's that little hole you got to go through and you're like this, there's nothing on your mind for, at that moment but the excitement of going down that and riding that ride. Mm -hmm. and when we get to heaven, it's going to be so fabulous, so exciting, like 1 Corinthians 3 when Paul talks about, <coughs> hey, God's going to give us things that we can't even dream of. Yeah. So when we get there, I think it's going to be just like that. It's walking into this amazing place and you're hit with all these things and spirits, greedy people, whatever it may be. It's like when you hit the plow, you don't look back. Mm -hmm. When we leave this earth, there's no reason to look back. Right. right. Well said. We, we're looking forward to this and it's going to happen someday. When that day is, we don't know. It's going to be in my lifetime, fine. If it's not in my lifetime, fine. 
It'll be what it'll be. And it's not something I need to be uh, terribly concerned about or worried about because it will happen the way it's supposed to happen. What I've got to be concerned about is that I'm ready, that if it were to happen today, that I'm ready. Or if I were to die today, I'm ready for that time when the Lord comes again. All right, other thoughts, comments? I always tie this in with 2 Peter 3.10. It starts off, he's going to come as a thief and mm -hmm. like totally unexpected. But once he comes, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then we go on through uh, verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 3. It tells us what's going to happen after this takes place. Mm -hmm. And everything's going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, we, we know the process and enough to be ready for it and to understand what's going to happen. It's just we don't know when. Les? This uh, passage Absolutely, it's life will go on. It's just where will it go on for you and for me? And we know where the two options are of that of that in our lives. So the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, that's again, assuming it's in our lifetime, assuming we happen to be alive or it was Paul or whatever the case may be, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus always be with the Lord. That's the key verse there. Always be with the Lord. That'll be what makes this special and unique. And that's the, again the process of going up and all of that uh, will uh, again as we said be spectacular and be all inspiring in that, in that regard. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Do not lose sleep over the dead in Christ because you're going to see them again. Don't worry about the dead in Christ. They're being cared for in ways you can't begin to imagine with our Lord. And so don't worry about that. And I, I'm sure that that's implied in what, what Paul is saying here. You comfort one another with these words because there were people in the church who were not comforted by the thoughts of death and they were worried about it and maybe losing their faith and their hope and, and dealing with that and Paul writes to them comfort each other with these words it's going to be okay and you've got to remember that in your in your life all right thoughts comments questions Sandy I just always wish in this section that Peter said and the dead in Christ will rise first go through that and then say and those that are not in Christ you know, go do the other side too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it does kind of just leave it. Yeah. It, I mean, we know from other scriptures, kind of, sort of, but it would have fit so nicely right. in here. Right, yeah. And, and, you know, so many so many things I wish were included in the Bible. But, uh, what was it that said? If everything Jesus did was written, what, what did it say? Couldn't couldn't hold the world couldn't hold it and so uh, he had to make it manageable for us uh, and you know our bible is a pretty good sized book as it is and so uh, i think he says he's given us unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness and so we have to know that what we need you know we need what we have we needed it for life we needed it for godliness what we don't have we didn't need for that and it wasn't I wouldn't say re relevant, but it wasn't necessary for us to know all of those particular details. A side excursion, and we'll start this next week, but I'll give you a heads up. Um, again, Paul was preparing the brethren of Thessalonica for the imminent return of Jesus. And there are people who argue that he did return. It's called the 8070 theory. And that Jesus came in 8070 when the temple was destroyed. 
And there's a whole doctrine wrapped around that. So we'll spend the first minutes of class next week looking at that, thinking about that, talking about why it's uh, very unlikely when we know all everything else about Scripture that that was the, the case. Uh, but Lord willing, we'll pick up there uh, next Sunday morning. Thank you.